Rolling. All right, we're going to start Sunday school, and uh, we'll start off with a word of prayer here, and we'll get into our study. So, uh, dear Lord, thank you very much for all your many blessings. Thank you for uh, having the doors open in church today. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to come and learn and uh, hear some preaching later today, and for the fellowship with the saints and all the good things that uh, church is about on Sunday. Uh, we ask you now to bless this uh, teaching that we're going to have this morning, bless the preaching later, and uh, be with us today. And we ask you to pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, so today we're going to be having a study about something that's uh, very important to what we believe here. Uh, here at Victory Baptist, we are an independent, fundamental, King James Bible-believing Baptist church. And the Bible believing part is uh, what kind of sets us apart here, that we believe what God says. And there's foundations to what we believe here. And one of the foundations, you know, you might have heard it talked about before, you might hear it in, in, in passing, but it doesn't seem like we really ever dive too far into the, the topic, into the subject. But this topic is one of the main foundations of learning how to read your Bible and how to rightly divide it. Uh, without this topic, you can get into all sorts of confusion. You can mix that stuff up. Uh, this topic is called dispensationalism. Uh, it, it, it's very important to know what dispensationalism is because this could mean the fact, the difference, where there's a lot of people nowadays that would mix things that aren't for us with things that are for you. and you'll come out with a whole bunch of confusion uh, instead of just rightly dividing and applying to you what is for you. So one of the main uh, cornerstones of, of our Bible-believing uh, belief here is dispensationalism. Uh, that's what we're going to learn about today. Uh, dispensationalism, you can get really deep into it. You can, you can have countless studies about dispensationalism as you go and you have case studies and read this passage or that passage or that passage this applies to all scripture so uh, theoretically there is no end to how many lessons you can do on this but on this lesson we're going to be talking about what the foundation is what it is how to apply it so some basics about dispensationalism uh, in the bible there's seven dispensations they are not equal time frames or unequal time frames uh, that the Bible is divided up into. It spans everywhere from the creation of man in the Garden of Eden all the way unto the new heaven and the new earth, which we find in Revelation 21, verse 1. Each dispensation is characterized by God changing his method on how he deals with mankind. Uh, each of these changes have to do with what man's responsibility is. Each of these changes has to do with in regards to how man is saved. And that's one of the key topics is about uh, salvation. There's all sorts of confusion even amongst Christians about how people are saved. And that's because they're applying different ages, different time periods to today. Uh, dispensations is about what he expects out of mankind and how mankind is to deal with sin. Uh, we find in each dispensation that it ends with man failing the test that God has given them. And... In turn, that test that's uh, failed turns into a judgment. God uses that test instead to, to judge the people. And then that dispensation closes out and a new dispensation opens. Uh, there's, like I said, if you want to really dig into the topic, into the matter, there's a couple nice books you can read. The main one that lays really a big foundation is uh, Charles Larkin. It's called Dispensational, uh, Dispensational Truth. Uh, Dr. David Walker, from what I understand, he's uh, made a 2.0 version. I don't know what the name of it is. You know what the name of it? So Dr. Walker came out with like a 2.0 version of uh, Charles Larkin's Dispensational Truth. Uh, there's also Schofield wrote about it. Uh, Schofield was one of the first, I believe, to, to write about it. So uh, those are three good authors there that they have some material you can dive into. And if you want to go a little further than what we'll be going over today. So we have reported in the Bible that five dispensations have already came and passed. Those are history. We're living in the sixth dispensation right now. And there's a seventh dispensation coming up after this one. Uh, 
because this one is going to end in judgment that you can read in the Bible. Uh, and we're going to move on to the seventh one. Dispensations prove that God has tried every single method that, you know, man standing before judgment one day is going to say, oh, hey, God, why didn't you do it this way? Why didn't you do it that way? If you did it like this, I could have I could have done it. And God's going to say, hey, I did everything. And to prove it, you guys failed at everything. You wouldn't have been any different if you were inserted into a, a different time period. Yes. You, you would have done the same thing. So God's going to have all his bases covered, you know, when you might be standing up there one day trying to say, hey, why did you do it this way? Why did you do it that way? Dispensations, the word dispensation is mentioned in Ephesians 3, 2. Uh, we're not going to be turning to too many places today, but we can go to that one. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2, says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. So Paul is talking about here that the dispensation that we're in right now is that dispensation of grace. That's the present dispensation. And he's letting you know, hey, you know, there's different time periods. He, he, he's acknowledging that fact right there. Uh, but also in Ephesians, we can see that uh, in Ephesians 2 7, go back a uh, page. Ephesians 2 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. So in ages to come, we have in the Bible, dispensations are also referred to as ages or days. Uh, not every mention of days is a dispensation, but. Uh, the word days can be used uh, synonymously as a dispensation. So we have also in Ephesians 2, 7, ages to come, that's the future. We have in Ephesians 3, 5, flip back to chapter 3. We have in Ephesians 3, 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it, it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So we have also in Ephesians an acknowledgement of dispensations in the past. So we have past, present, future, all within uh, two chapters here in Ephesians that Paul is recognizing. So most Christians agree that there are at least two dispensations. I say most because there's every sort of, of, of confusion out there nowadays. Uh, even Christians that try to mix up obvious things that weren't meant for us, which was the Jewish law, and they're trying to apply that nowadays. So I, I say most because most Christians agree that the law is done with and we're living in the age of grace right now. And I think most people would, you know, on, on, on the cover on first glance would agree with that statement that there's at least two dispensations. So the old one, which was the Old Testament, the, the law of Moses, it ended uh, with the death of the testator. So we have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament. So the Old Testament, which was uh, by and large categorized by the Jewish law, it ended with the death of the testator, which was in the Gospels. And that's what started the New Testament. So we have there a clear distinction with somebody that's never studied dispensationalism. Uh, Jesus dying on the cross put an end to the law. He fulfilled the law and he put an end to it and he ushered in the uh, the age of grace that we're living in now so what I would say to that is if you can recognize that um, that there is a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament there's a difference of how man was saved so if there's a difference between how man was saved between there and here uh, we can go a little further and we can see in other places how before the law because the law didn't show up until Moses was on Mount Sinai there is a period of, of time before that. In the future, we can see there's a, there's a period of time after the age of grace that we're in now. So there's different times where people, uh, in different times, how people have been getting saved. <clears throat> we're going to study that a little bit uh, right now today. Uh, so, like I mentioned before, many denominations are full of confusion because they don't rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, some even claim that they do rightly divide. You can bring up the fact, you know, you can bring up that verse that talks about rightly dividing the word. And they will say, oh, we rightly divide the word. They'll put it even on their, their statement of, of belief on their website. 
but then you could read a couple lines down, it's you guys don't rightly divide because you have a major issue with what you said here. And because of that, you have some confusion that applies over here. And I, I'm being a little broad, but we can get into some specific cases and see how dispensationalism comes with rightly dividing and things just fit into place that way. Uh, so as we do our study today, it's important to make a note that each verse of scripture throughout the Bible has three different applications. The applications are historical, which doesn't mean it's all history. Historical application means is it past, is it present, or is it future? That's these these are whole studies on them on their own. I'm just giving you the tools and, and we're, we're doing a little crash course on what dispensationalism is right now. Uh, there's spiritual application. So each verse of the Bible also has spiritual application. And that's meaning, do you apply this verse practically, which is literally, or is it a spiritual application? Uh, there's, again, a lot of, of ways to cut that up. But there's a verse you can take and you can say, hey... That's obviously something that was literal to this guy at this time. But instead of that, we can apply it spiritually to us. Yeah. There's a spiritual lesson to learn in that verse, even if it has to do with some guy that lived 2,000 years ago being told to do something specifically. We also have the third application of every verse in the Bible. It's doctrinal, uh, which means it can lay a foundation about a certain subject. So those are three applications of every verse in the Bible. There's also another three important details to analyze about every verse of Scripture. So we have those three, and this is a different set of three. It's who is this book, chapter, or verse written to? Is it written to an individual? Is it written to a nation? Is it written to a specific group of people? And that way, if you correctly identify uh, who it was written to, you can say, hey, if this was written to a Jewish person, uh, it's not necessarily written to a Gentile. Uh, it's, it, it's a very surefire way to see, to clear up some confusion. There's some verses that, you know, might not be super clear when you just read the verse, but you can read some context. Hey, who's this book written to? Oh, this book was written to the Hebrews, to the Israelites. Uh, oh, hey, this, this is written to here, this is written to there. So that can help you divvy up that one. We can also see when was it written. Was it written in the past? Uh, uh, was it written to a group that was existed at this time during this dispensation? That's an important one as we study today, when it was written. And then we can also see what is the context? What is the context that this verse was used in? There's even a, an example we went over here uh, a few weeks ago you know, about a baptism of fire. People use that like it's something good. It's hey, read the context. The context isn't something positive when, when you're when you're reading that. So, if somebody says something that you know sounds a little fishy or doesn't sound right or it sounds new, I encourage you to apply these three things to it. And yeah. One of those is, is read the context. What is what is this really about? What's the, what's the Bible really saying about this? Not what somebody's trying to make the Bible say by using this verse. So, what does the Bible really say? So these questions will help identify if a verse or passage applies to us doctrinally speaking today. So let's go ahead and let's label. I mentioned there's seven dispensations. Let's label the seven dispensations. We have the first one, man is innocent. The second one, man is under conscience. Third one, man is in authority over the earth. Uh, this is also called the human gov government, governance. We have number four, man under promise. You don't have to write man under all these. You can just write innocence, conscience, authority, promise. Fifth one, man is under law. The sixth one, which is where we're living in today, man is under grace. The seventh one, coming up in the future, man is under the personal reign of Jesus Christ. So a word of caution is that I'm mentioning seven dispensations here. Uh, some people will try to say there's way more than seven. Uh, we call these people hyper dispensationalists. They try to cut up the Bible way more than it, it's, it's clearly cut up into. I think seven's a good number anyway. 
So yeah. it's a number of completion. Uh, we, we have people that try to say that there's way more ways to cut it up and that uh, grace was different than what we have today. And uh, they can argue something, but like I said before, when you put things into context, you'll see that their argument doesn't hold. Uh, we can also see, um, and I'm not going to get too far into it uh, in this lesson, but there is technically what I would agree with another one other than seven. There's a transitional age between the law and grace where we're at today. Uh, the book, it's the book of Acts. The book of Acts was a transitional period, uh, but that was under the, uh, the dispensation of grace anyway. So you can call it seven still, but there's still a little transition period there. So we'll get into the first one here <clears throat> with uh, man is innocent. So the innocence of man, the first dispensation that God tried to do here on earth with, with mankind, was uh, it started with Adam. And this started in Genesis chapter 2, verses 7. Uh, and this dispensation lasted all the way until man was uh, expelled from the garden after he fell. So Adam was made in the image of God, and he was made innocent and ignorant to good and evil. He, didn't, he wasn't created with that understanding. And Adam, in chapter 2, verse 17, Genesis 2, 17, he was given one rule. That one rule was to abstain from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God said, thou shalt surely die if you take from it. And surely we see that uh, man did die that day. It wasn't a physical death, it was a spiritual death. And that was his salvation. His salvation rested upon him obeying God. And the moment he disobeyed God, he, he, he died spiritually. That disobedience led to, it was probably the most catastrophic of all the judgments that we see from the failures of, of man through each dispensation. And that's because uh, on that day, mankind fell. Uh, our, well, until the age of grace today would save people, uh, fellowship with God ceased. Uh, people were spiritually dead, born spiritually dead. Uh, and that's a problem that we have today. Uh, man is still born spiritually dead because of what happened back then. Uh, we also have, with this judgment that, was, that happened, I, I, I let you know that each dispensation ends with a judgment. The dispensation of innocence, the judgment that happened on that day, was, like I mentioned, uh, man spiritually dying, but... There was also curses pronounced. Man was cursed. Female was cursed. The earth was cursed. A lot of curses entered into the world that day uh, because man fell. Uh, <clears throat> in this dispensation, salvation came from obedience to the ins instructions of God. So here we have, uh, back when this dispensation was going, physical works for your salvation. It's separate from today. And I'll make that contrast now before we get into dispensation of grace. But today there's no physical works that are needed in order to have salvation. Amen. Salvation comes just by grace alone. Uh, we'll get more into that one later. But back in the garden, it was, it was physical works to be saved. There's no element of faith involved because man walked and talked with God in the garden. You didn't have to have faith that God existed. You could, God made him with eyeballs. You could see God existed. So uh, we also see, um, I'll, get, I'll get into this, this one on the, next, on the next topic. So that dispensation came and went already, ended in judgment. The next dispensation that opened up after that was man under conscience. So this dispensation came from, began when man fell and was cast out of the garden. And this one ended with Noah's flood, also in Genesis. So Adam and Eve, they now had the knowledge of good and evil because they partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, and when they did this, now that they knew what good and evil was, they could transmit this onto their offspring. So all mankind came from Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve was able to tell all their descendants, this is good, this is evil. It was we, good and evil is now on the, on the conscience of man. It's, it's written in, in their heart. Uh, what good and evil is. So under this dispensation, mankind had to eschew evil and 
cling to what is good in order to be saved. So no longer are they, work, are they walking in the garden with God. So there's an element of faith involved in this. It's believe God is real, believe good and evil is real, but also practice, practice what you know is good and, and evil. And uh, so that's work. So we have an element of, of faith and we have an element of works involved when man was under conscience. So we see in this dispensation now that uh, I didn't mention it uh, when man fell in the garden, but when man fell in the garden, God sacrificed an animal uh, to give them cloth covering, but also what we see was a practice of an atonement for, for sin uh, with the innocent blood shed of, a, of an innocent animal. That was the temporary covering. It wasn't a permanent covering. That's why sacrifices have to always constantly be done uh, before Jesus was that um, Adam and Eve saw that an, an, an innocent animal was killed for their sin. So they had this testament uh, to, 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 to live by. And all their descendants also knew this. So when man was under their own conscience, they saw that they saw that an innocent animal had to die for, for, for sin, for things that were not done correctly. And no matter who it was, this was known uh, throughout all of history now that that was what was happened. So it was up to every parent to give what was, you know, what was right, what was wrong, pass it down to their children. So everybody should have known at this time what to do um, in order to be saved. And that was uh, faith in God and works. So we see that um, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, you can go ahead and turn there. So Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his thought of of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, and if you go over to verse 11, chapter 6, verse 11, we see that the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So mankind was obviously not practicing what his conscience of good and evil was. He, uh, he, he seared his conscience, even though that's a New Testament kind of a, a phrase there, but he, he knew in his conscience what was good, and he chose to do evil. And so that was the test of mankind during this time, and man failed that test. So God judged the world. He judged mankind for their failure to adhere to what his rule was. It was, hey, just, just live in good conscience, do good, and eschew evil. So this ended with uh, Noah's flood. It's a story that I think everybody in the world knows that uh, in, in Genesis chapter 7, that God flooded the earth, and only the righteous, which was Noah and his family, uh, survived that. And the whole world, which was full of evil, perished uh, at that time. So we move on from here, where man is now in authority over earth. So this period of time was um, after Noah's flood that God gave them. I think it was uh, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 9, verses 2. Genesis 9, 2. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hands are they delivered. So this, with a couple other verses, we can see that God is delivering the whole world into man's hands. He's saying, hey, now you have dominion over the earth. We see in chapter 9, verses 5. Um, talking about uh, surely that your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it at the hand of man at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man so here God is telling man hey in, in part of your authority over the earth is uh, capital punishment now so if he says if, if he has some some a list here of, of, of what to do but Basically, if there's, a, if there's a shedding of blood by man's hand, or we see even in the Levitical law, which is another dispensation, but 
Uh, things had to die, life for a life. So this was the introduction of capital punishment. Um, we see God also commanding for Noah's descendants to fill the earth. It was fill the earth. And uh, we see later that they failed this. And um, this dispensation ended at the Tower of Babel. And if you know what happened at the Tower of Babel, instead of man separating to fill the earth, they congregated. So uh, we'll get into that one in a moment here. But this was human government on the earth. So it's also that faith in God and plus works during this time. They had to govern according to the way God said to govern. And mankind failed this. So like I said, at the Tower of Babel, judgment was pronounced. Uh, God didn't like that what was man was doing, which was trying to congregate and build for themselves a tower to go into heaven. And God said no, and he confused the languages at that point, if you know the story. So man's languages were confused. There was tribes now, and God scattered them on the face of the earth. So that was God's judgment. He said, you know, you guys could have gone willingly, but now you guys are going to be confu with confused languages and different tribes and and as we see throughout history, uh, the introduction of different people groups has just been strife and uh, people warring with each other and a lot of no good coming from that. Uh, we can see more about this. If you want to write down some notes, if you're writing notes, you can look at Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, Genesis 15, 5, and Genesis 28, verses 12 and 13. So we have after this... Uh, man is under promise. So man under promise started with Abram. Abram was a man who lived in the uh, city of Ur. U R Ur. I believe that's how you pronounce it. And God called Abraham out of Ur, and He made a covenant with him. This covenant was there was two parts to it. There was parts of the covenant that were conditional. So it was if you do this, this will happen. If you don't do this, this will happen. It was that kind of a deal. It was, uh, this won't happen if you don't do this, in other words. Uh, and then there was parts of the covenant that were unconditional. God was just saying, hey, I'm going to bless you with this no matter what. Uh, it, it was, you know, you're going to have many, many, uh, many nations are going to come from you. Kings are going to come from you. You're going to have the promised land. That was one of the biggest promises there. And he was going to establish all these people groups out of, out of uh, Abram. Uh, his name is Abraham as we know it, but at the time his name was Abram. So Abraham's offspring violated all of the conditional promises. You can't violate really the unconditional promises because God said no matter what, you're going to have this. But the conditional promises, uh, like in Genesis 26, let's turn there. Genesis 26, verse 2. Uh, it says, And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell of thee. You can read a little bit more down, but that's the main verse there. So God made all these promises to Abraham. And what did man do? At the end of uh, Genesis, we can see that. Um, so let me back up a little bit here. This dispensation was for a group of people. This dispensation was for Abraham and his descendants. Uh, I know that sometimes people try to apply some of the promises to Abraham to them today. Um, not only to mention this dispensation has come and gone already, but this dispensation was for a different people group. Even the conditional promises which stretch into today and which are still ongoing today with, with the Israel, with uh, the whole Israel uh, dilemma. Uh, this, that's still alive and well today, but people try to apply it to them, and it wasn't for them, because they're not Israelites, they're not offspring of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So we see uh, in Genesis 26, 2, God says to the Israelites, or they weren't Israelites at the time, but to Abraham, do not go into Egypt. So Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had the 12 tribes, and in those 12 tribes, which were known as the Israelites, what did they do? They went down into Egypt. So the judgment of God in this uh, dispensation of promise, 
They went down into Egypt and they became slaves. They went into bondage, into bondage in Egypt. It wasn't a good time when they spent, uh, I forgot how many years, it was hundreds of years they spent in Egypt uh, in subjugation to Pharaoh and the Egyptians and massacres and it, it wasn't a good time for them. Uh, <clears throat> so in this dispensation, we can, uh, it, it, it's a little bit of uh, controversy, especially today. And uh, Brother Mike did a good job of explaining this one in his series. If you haven't heard it, uh, you can go on YouTube or you can click on his playlist. It's called The Doctrine of Righteousness. So there was an element of faith involved for salvation at this time. But again, it was also works. So we can cross-reference, and this is a whole study here that Mikey's already... Uh, gone through but we have uh, if you want to write down the references there's Hebrews 11 there's Romans 4 and there's James 2 verse 21 and we see in Hebrews and Romans that uh, Abraham received his righteousness through faith but we can see very clearly that it was his faith was able to um, give him the works that he needed to do and he was justified by his works. Uh, it wasn't this looking forward to the cross. The cross wasn't even made known at the time. And nonetheless, even though this was before all the prophets, even when the prophets prophesied about Jesus, they were looking for the second advent, which is a whole other study. But everybody was looking for Jesus to come as a king. They weren't looking for somebody to come and die on the cross for their sins as a servant. Nobody was looking for that. So for people to say that Abraham, uh, you know, he had faith that Jesus was going to come and die on the cross, you know, that, that, that wasn't it. And it's very clear that we can see um, in that other study that we had here. Um, so man under promise, faith and works. We have next after this, um, I mentioned that the failure was uh, them going into Egypt and that was their judgment. And we transition over to man under law. So, man under law, the moment this started was, uh, it was Exodus chapter 20, where Moses received the uh, commandments from the Lord, and the Israelites put this upon themselves, even though that we see that uh, in Galatians chapter 3 verse 10, that, um, that the law was a curse. Um, at the time, the Israelites all said, hey, we'll, we'll do everything the Lord has spoken, we will do. So, they put themselves under the law. So throughout the wandering, so the, the Israelites received the law, and the law is what they had to live by uh, in order to have salvation. And later they received, on top of the Ten Commandments, the, the full Mosaic law, which was also the ordinances. So the law told you what to do, and the ordinances were, if you fail to do this, if, 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 you, if, you, if you sin, because now that you have the law, uh, Paul said in Romans 3.20, with the law came the knowledge of sin. How else can you know what sin is without the law? So um, now that there was the knowledge of sin, if you ever messed up in the law, you knew what to do. It was, hey, go do this, go do that, uh, go kill that bird, go kill that, sacrifice that animal, uh, go wash yourself this way, wash yourself that way. Uh, this was the law. And no man could you know, fulfill the law except for the Lord, um, Jesus Christ the Lord. So. The law was a curse to the Israelites to live under it. Um, so now we have, we, we still have the works and we still have the law, but there was more works now to be done because the, the law was fully detailing what sin was. So it was a whole lot of works in conjunction with that faith. And just like we saw with, with Abraham, unless you had that, that faith, you weren't going to do the works. So unless you had the faith in the law and the law and God, you weren't going to do the works. But the works was a, was a major, major part of salvation during this time. So we see this uh, at this period was the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. It was their conquest in the land of Canaan, which was the promised land. And it was when Israel had the promised land and it was it, it was them reciting in that land. 
And when they were in the land, they requested to have kings from God, and God gave them kings. And we can see, if we turn over to the book of 2 Kings, that throughout, throughout the whole dispensation, uh, God was giving grace. It wasn't dispensation of grace, but there was grace in this dispensation. We'll go to 2 Kings chapter 17. Um, that through the period of hundreds and hundreds of years, um, I didn't do the math on how long this time period was, but I think it was even uh, over a thousand years that man was constantly failing his test, failing his test, failing his test. And God uh, had his grace in uh, not squashing them out in judgment during this time. So we have um, in 2 Kings 17, we'll start in verse 1 to set it up. It says, In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, began Hosiah, the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years. It says, And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. So we can skip down to verse 18 to sum up what is in between here. It says, Therefore the Lord was very angry at Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Um, let, let, let's back up and read uh, verse 17 also. It says, And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So here we have it. We have, this was towards the end of what we know as, uh, not, not as the uh, man under law, but as Israel um, failing the test and judgment happening here. So even though judgment happened here, we still had hundreds and hundreds of years until the dispensation closed. But um, the judgment here was that Israel and Judah both separately went under um, captivity. They were conquered and uh, a lot of bad stuff happened to them and to all the people that were inside the, the nations there. And that was their judgment, that they went into captivity. And that judgment still lasts even till today. Um, the Israelites were scattered out of the promised land uh, upon the face of the earth. And here we still have it today. Even though Israel has their own nation today, uh, the, Israel, uh, the Jewish people are still scattered uh, amongst the earth. And it's not until after this current dispensation that we're in until they get all gathered back up again um, into, the, into the promised land again. So, <clears throat> man under law, the test was failed many times throughout the thousands of years. And we see that, you know, the kings were evil and they just did evil. And they failed as a, as a, as a whole. And like I mentioned, that was their, their judgment. And this dispensation came to a full close when Jesus Christ died on the cross. That was the end of the law. And we entered into man under grace uh, when Jesus Christ died on the cross. He did away with the law. He fulfilled the law completely. And now we are no longer works-based. We are, like I mentioned at the beginning of our study here, we are by, uh, by grace through faith. It's by faith alone. So it's been a pinnacle, and we'll see after this that it goes back into works after our dispensation today. But we're at the top right now, and it, there's never been a better period of time that by faith only that you're saved and you don't have to do works to keep your salvation as it's going to be in the future after the dispensation of grace is done with. So we have pure grace now and this dispensation will soon end with man failing to obtain the free gift of grace. As we're seeing today, you know, the curtain's closing on the age of grace where people are shooting it down. They don't even want to uh, go with the easiest thing that there's ever been right now, yeah. uh, just to live in, in rebellion and, and, and serve themselves. They're trying to do the man is an authority thing, but the wrong way, and it's the wrong way of doing the dispensation at the wrong time, and there's a lot to say about that. So um, this judgment, um, this dispensation is going to end in judgment. The judgment is going to be the great tribulation. Um, the great tribulation is going to um, then usher in um, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we see in uh, Thessalonians. 
and he's going to gather up the saints, which are both sleeping, the ones that have passed on before us for the last 2,000 years, and, um, and us who are alive and remain in, in the world today. And the Lord's going to come and, and gather us all out in the rapture, and this is going to usher in the great tribulation. So rapture first, tribulation second, rightly divide the word. The tribulation is going to be the judgment um, for seven years, the great tribulation on the earth. And that's going to be the judgment to all mankind who um, did not um, accept uh, the Lord Jesus Christ's free gift of, 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 of grace. So that's going to be the, um, the judgment there. If you want to read a little bit about the tribulation, I have some references here. It's Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. You have Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. You have Daniel chapter 12, verses 1. And you have Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 5 through 7. That tells you about the great tribulation. So... There's a transition period, like I mentioned before, um, between the, the period of, of law and grace. Um, this is chiefly, so even though, let me start by saying this, even though Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four gospels are in the New Testament, uh, during this time, Jesus was alive. And remember, the dispensation of law didn't end until Jesus died on the cross. And we don't see until the end of, of, of the gospel uh, books that Jesus died. So there was still the, 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 the period of, of, of law. So it was kind of a, a transition period, but it was still the law. That's why Jesus was, you know, preaching a lot of times the law when he was alive. He was preaching works. But Jesus was also preaching about um, the tribulation period and about the millennium, which is coming after this dispensation. So that's why it's important. These are very important books to rightly divide, or else you can get a lot of confusion. Not everything that Jesus spoke was to us. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't for us, but it was to us. So um, there, there's a whole lot of studying to do there. So not to make you guys too confused, but um, like I said, there was that time period when Jesus was here. He was talking about the law. He was talking about the, the dispensation of, of grace. He was talking about the uh, tribulation. And he was talking about the millennium. These are different different time periods here. We have the book of Acts, which was after Jesus died and grace was coming in. Um, there's a small transition there because um, even as we can see with, um, even we can, if we have time, we'll go and probably won't have it, but I'll give you the reference about Jesus talking directly about dispensation and the way that he taught. But uh, we can see that there is a, a transition there because there wasn't supposed to be the gospel and grace going to the Gentiles. Jesus was supposed to have, in his plan, have, have, have died um, and come back really quickly again with his salvation going just to the Jews. But the Jews rejected the gospel and salvation then went to the Gentiles. So there we have it, a pause. Uh, it's called a parenthetical period where there was a, a, a pause in, uh, in, the, in, the 70, in the 70th week of uh, Jacob's trouble, um, as, as you can go and study it. And you'll see that now we have the tribulation being put off and the millennial period being put off instead of something that was supposed to come almost instantaneous. Um, so I think I didn't exhaust it, but I gave you everything about the uh, age of grace here and how it ends. Uh, then we have coming up in the future after the tribulation, after us, we're all out of here. Those of us who are saved, uh, we're up and out of here. After the seven years tribulation comes, the personal reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. So this is where the Jews missed their savior. They thought that this was how Jesus was going to come the first time. He was going to come, establish his kingdom on the earth, the kingdom of heaven. He was going to rule as a king. He was going to throw off all the oppressors, the Romans. And uh, no, he, this is how he's coming now the second time. So uh, after God pours out his wrath, he's going to come. It's called the second advent. He'll establish his kingdom. This kingdom is called the millennium, the millennial period. It's going to last for 1,000 years. Uh, this dispensation is going to end 
with Satan being loosed for a little time at the end of the 1,000 years from the bottomless pit that he's cast into for the 1,000 years. Uh, and he's going to make a rebellion. He's going to cause a rebellion to happen against Jesus Christ, even though he's here ruling on the earth. So that gives me my point to make here that Jesus Christ on the earth, there's no really faith involved. You see God on earth. You don't have to have faith. You know, you can see him. Um, so there's no more faith involved. It's, it's works. It's works to be saved during this time. So here we are. You know, I mentioned the pinnacle. Works. Works in faith. Just faith. Now we're going back into works and faith. Um, and uh, I'm sorry. The works and faith is during the tribulation period um, where you need the works and faith. Uh, it's a little little transitional period again. There's a couple transitional periods. Uh, but then after that, we move into the millennial, which is no more um, works and faith. It's just back into works. So it's a mirror. It's, the Bible is a mirror here, you know, from where it was to where it began to where it's closing. And um, Jesus is going to, of course, he's going to squash this rebellion that uh, is going to happen at the end. And after this rebellion, um, you know, that's that's going to be the, the judgment. Rebellion is going to get squashed. And then we have what's called the great white throne of judgment where the wicked and the dead are uh, all called up before the great white throne of judgment. And these aren't regenerated souls. These aren't saved souls. The great white throne of judgment are those who are uh, not, that have never received salvation. And um, they're going to be judged and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. And at this point, uh, this is where this dispensation ends. And we enter with God creating a new heaven and a new earth. And this is where we step into eternity. And um, you can read about these things in uh, Acts chapter 15, verses 14 through 17. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 and 4, 1 through 4, sorry. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And all of Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, you'll read about uh, what's going to happen in this seventh dispensation. Uh, so I'm going to finish up here in the next minute or two. But, um, you know, we can see things that when you have dispensationalism all mapped out properly, uh, no longer are you going to try to, you know, you have a thousand piece puzzle. No longer you're going to try to get the wrong piece of puzzle and you're going to try to squash it into the wrong place. And, you know, it's obviously going to look wrong. You're going to say, hey, you know, that's that's not right. The holes don't fit up. The colors don't fit up. So there's two problems. Not only is that not right, but now that piece that should have went somewhere else, you're going to have a hole somewhere else. So, you know, not dividing correctly with, you know, not uh, having the right dispensations and applying them correctly. There's multiple problems that can happen with that. Um, and we can also see another point to make through dispensations is that uh, we've heard the saying here before that judgment starts with God's people at the house of God. So um, both through the Israelites and even through us now in the age of grace through the Gentiles and, and the saints. Uh, can't even just say the Gentiles because there's no more Jews or Greeks now. They're just uh, saved saints if you're in the body of Christ. But um, it, it, it comes with the people that knew what the dispensation was that didn't do it that brought in the judgment. So even like we have today, judgment, it's because of, of the church um, failing what we should have, what we should do. Um, thank God we're at the pinnacle now where it's faith only, Amen. by grace through faith. And I did promise, well I didn't promise, but I told you that um, there's something you can go and look up. It's pretty cool if you go and look it up and you study this, but in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 20, uh, Jesus is, uh, let me turn there. Jesus is preaching, or he's not preaching, he, he's preaching, you know, he's teaching, I did promise, all right, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, and we'll read down to verse 20 real quick, it says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach, this is the important one, verses 19 here, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. So you'd have to read Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2 to know what's going on here. Uh, we'll go there real quick. You want to hold your place in Luke. So Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1. Tell me if this sounds familiar. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. So that's what um, verse 18 was right here. And then verse 19 of uh, Luke chapter 4 coincides with what we're going to read next here of Isaiah 61 verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. So... There's a comma here, and if you reference that in here to uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus put a period there. When he was speaking, he put a period, and he didn't read the rest of, of the verse that we see in verse 2. Mm -hmm. That's because this is two different dispensations, and Jesus, of course, he, he, he knew what was going on because he is the Word, and uh, he, 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 put, he put a period where there's a comma here because he was fulfilling... Uh, one dispensation. He wasn't di fulfilling both dispensations at the same time. Amen. Because we see in chapter 61 verses 2 says, at the second part of it, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. So we know the day of vengeance, that that's a tribulation. So God, Jesus didn't come to start the tribulation in the millennium right away. He came for what we see in verse uh, 19 of, uh, of, of Luke 4 to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's his first coming. That's his first advent. So there you have it. Even Jesus was a dispensationalist. Amen. Yeah. So uh, that concludes our crash course here on, uh, on dispensationalism. And I hope through that one example there and even through the examples that I gave about salvation that uh, we can see how important um, rightly dividing dispensations and uh, applying them to our life now, how important that is for for uh, what we do here. So let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you very much uh, for helping me to teach this lesson today. Thank you for helping to prepare it and uh, to deliver it. I pray that it was clear to the understanding of those who are listening and to it and whoever might be listening to it uh, on the internet afterward. I pray uh, that you give us a good rest of our day here. Uh, you help with uh, the preaching. You give uh, the preacher the words to say, and we get something good out of that later today. Pray for the fellowship and the lunch and everything that's going to happen today. I pray for uh, our brothers and sisters who are not here with us today that are traveling uh, and who are recovering. Um, I pray that you help them uh, with speedy recovery recoveries. I pray that uh, you give travel mercies. I pray that anybody that's going to be showing up to uh, the next service that you help them get here safe. Pray for safe travels on the way back home for everybody today. And I pray for a good spirit in the church today. And I uh, ask to pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, real quick, we got a B.